Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Todd Clint's SharePoint Netcast number 179, recorded live Monday, 25th, 2013. I am your host and the American Music Awards Artist of the Year. I like to thank all the little people. Thank you, thank you, Todd Clint. Um, as always, the folks at Rackspace are to thank for all the stuff uh, the microphone, the the monitor, the flag, all that kind of stuff. The, the, even the PowerPoint template that I'm using, that's all Rackspace. Uh, so you can do me a solid by going out to SharePoint.Rackspace.com right now. Whatever you're doing, stop and go out to SharePoint.Rackspace.com. Uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll be here waiting. I'll, I'll let you do what you need to do. But go out there, poke around. There's got a, they've got a bunch of uh, great stuff out there information about you know like free content videos and articles and maybe even a thing or two about uh, the services that Rackspace has for SharePoint so go out to sharepoint.rackspace.com and if you have a fancy mobile device one of them uh, them I iPhones do they still make iPhones uh, one of those iPhones or a Windows phone you know a proper phone uh, now we've got a fancy mobile view for that so you get the, the better scrolling and the better size tiles there's just something for everybody there at uh, sharepoint.rackspace.com and the more you guys go there the more they let me keep doing this so you know it's all it's all good for production notes I think everything went pretty well last week uh, got everything rendered out pretty well I think I got the blog post out I now that I think about it I think I forgot to update the RSS feed uh, but I can do that uh, that pretty quickly so uh, but other than that quality was good machine didn't poop out on me anything like that so uh, so it was all very good so now we'll jump into the topics for this week a few things going on it's been kind of a slow week uh, number one because you know this, here in the states this is a holiday week Thanksgiving and so things start to slow down around uh, around the holidays so in the next couple of weeks boy there's gonna be some really uh, boring content coming out because just here in the states everybody kind of gets slow but we do have a few fun things to talk about this week the first is uh, kind of a weird thing though I understand why they why they did it but last week Microsoft announced that SharePoint 2013 service pack one is going to happen so they didn't announce that the service pack was out or or anything about that all they did was confirm to us that uh, the SharePoint 2013 will get a service pack one. It no longer needs to covet SharePoint 2010 service pack one and two. It's going to get a service pack of its own, which pre-announcing a service pack seems kind of weird, but um, I guess they're giving us plenty of time to plan for it, you know, do, do all the stuff we got to do for the big upgrades. For, for a SharePoint folks and for uh, admin folks and all that kind of stuff, there's really two big things coming in service pack one. And the big one is that it will introduce Windows Server 2012 R2 support. So right now, SharePoint 2013 does not support Windows 2012 R2. So Service Pack 1 will support that. That will add that support. The other big thing that gives us, and the whole reason that they posted this, was it shows us that on-premises SharePoint is not dead. For a lot of folks, especially guys like me that are of the administrator of variety, there's been a lot of concern or question about um, what the future of on-premises SharePoint is going to be. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Microsoft seems to be pushing this whole cloud thing a little bit. They seem serious about it this time. They've been trying to do this cloud thing for a while. I think this time it's really going to stick. I think they really mean it this time. It's not, uh, not empty threats. But they've really been pushing it hard. And I think for a lot of folks that do on-premises stuff, it's been kind of scary because we don't hear about SharePoint anymore. SharePoint went from being the darling of, of Microsoft. You know, it was a $2 billion this and, and the biggest that and the fastest that and everybody loves SharePoint and everything. And then all of a sudden, almost overnight, SharePoint sort of vanished and everything became Office 365. And so guys like me that work with a lot of on-premises SharePoint kind of got a little nervous and thought, you know, what better way for Microsoft to force people to use SharePoint Online or Office 365 than by just making the on-premises version gone or not current or whatever. 
And there's been a lot of discussion about that. I bet I've had that conversation about what the future of on-premises SharePoint is. I bet I've had it with 10 people uh, within the last few months. And these are people, I mean, they were, I'm, I'm talking about like community folks, folks who are in the know, folks who do this kind of stuff a lot. There's just a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. So the real reason that they posted this blog post not was to tell us that SharePoint 2013 was going to get a service pack because that wasn't, I mean, telling us that months ahead of time doesn't really do us any good, but I think they finally felt like it was a good time to reassure us that SharePoint 2013 was not dead. SharePoint 2013 on-premises was not dead, and that there will be, you know, new patches and things like that. And so um, I think that's why it was. So, so take heart. I'm not going to have to get a, a real job. I'm not going to have to start working for a living. These hands will continue to not have calluses. I will continue to have that uh, that fluorescent tan, uh, you know, from my from the lights here in my office. That, so that's good news. I don't have to get a real job. But uh, but that's kind of why they did it. So it's good they threw us a bone. I appreciate that. But it is uh, again, you know, we do know it's coming out. So now we can plan for it. Uh, start getting those test environments ready to go. Really, all that they have said is that we'll, it will be out next year. It could be January 1st. It could be, uh, you know, June 29th. Who, uh, who knows? But it is coming. So this, uh, this next topic, uh, I'm going to lead into it. This is one of those cool things. I am just a big nerd, and I get uh, big nerd crushes. The, the first time that I met, you know, guys like, like Mark Manassi or Mark Rusinovich or those guys, um, I mean, these guys are guys that I've looked up to. I get, you know, I get nerd, uh, nerd crushes, things like that, and sort of had a, a touch with that this last week. So on uh, sometime last week, I think the 19th maybe, uh, I was tweeting crap like I always do. It's just blather. It's just worthless. But somebody favorited one of my tweets, and the guy that favorited uh, my tweet was a guy named Eric Lawrence. Now, some of you might think, oh, Eric Lawrence. Todd went to college with him. Well, I did go to a guy, go to college with a guy named Eric Lawrence, uh, works up the street here, but it wasn't him. It was Eric Lawrence of Fiddler. It was the guy that wrote Fiddler. Somehow, some way, the guy that wrote, writes Fiddler, Eric Lawrence, sees my tweets. I don't think he's following me, but uh, whatever. And he favored it. I fell out of my chair, nearly crushed my cat. It was, uh, it was very terrifying. So kind of opened up a, uh, a dialogue with um, with Eric just to say hey and all that kind of stuff and uh, just kind of told him hey I'm a big fan of uh, big fan of your work I like it uh, uh, you know Fiddler's pretty cool I said I use it a lot for a fair SharePoint and he said uh, wow that's uh, that's pretty cool I worked on SharePoint when I was at Microsoft only it wasn't called SharePoint back then it was not really having a name that back then so that was pretty cool but I didn't bring that up just to brag on all of everybody that uh, Eric Lawrence favorited one of my tweets, though. Did you hear? Eric Lawrence favorited one of my tweets. But um, in my time timeline there on Twitter, I had a few folks saying, hey, you know, what's Fiddler? Why should I care about Fiddler? You're kind of making a big deal about it. So I thought I would spend some time. <laughs> Somebody in the chat room is using Fiddler right now trying to figure out why he can't get the live feed to work. And he can't even hear this. I feel terrible for him. Um, but I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes just talking about what Fiddler was, uh, how it works, how I use it, uh, things like that. So first off, Fiddler is a, uh, boy, I don't even know how to describe it now, but it's like a, a troubleshooter for web conversations. It lets you eavesdrop in on HTTP and HTTPS conversations to see what's going on, and you can see each of the packets and the requests and that kind of stuff. Just invaluable when it comes to troubleshooting. And the way that it works is that it wedges itself in as a proxy between your web browser and wherever your web browser is going. So you install Fiddler and it just sits there and it doesn't do anything, and you browse around doing whatever and going wherever. No judgment. You know, we're all consenting adults here. But when you want to try to troubleshoot something, then you fire Fiddler up and it wedges itself between your web browser and the outside world. So your web browser goes on continuing to do all the things that it does, and but then you can watch it happen inside of Fiddler, and you can look at packets, and you can look at things, and it's crazy. It also works for other applications. So if you end up having like TweetDeck sitting off on the side or something, it's going to start showing those things and you know different messengers and that kind of stuff. Really great tool. So it, it wedges itself in as an HTTP proxy. 
You can also wedge it in so that it can uh, do basically man in the middle stuff for HTTPS. Because clearly, if it can't uh, can't decrypt the stuff, it can't do you any good. So, um, so that's how it uh, how it works. There are a million ways to use it with SharePoint, but I thought I would uh, cover just a few that I use because this is kind of an administrator thing. So, uh, so we'll talk about that. The first thing that I use it for is I use it to find out why pages are slow. So I don't know about you guys, but as a SharePoint administrator, once or twice in my uh, long ten-year now career with SharePoint, I've gotten this this uh, this complaint. And tell me if you've heard this one before. <clears throat> it goes something like this. SharePoint slow. Now you may not have gotten this one before. This might be a you know an Iowa thing or a Todd thing, but it comes up once in a while for me. And there are a bunch of different reasons why SharePoint can be slow. And Fiddler is one of the tools that I use to figure out why a page is slow. On more than one occasion, uh, Fiddler has shown me that the reason a page was slow was not because SQL was slow, was because SharePoint was slow. It was because there was a two megabyte bitmap file, uh, you know, as the company logo up in the corner. And it gets tough to troubleshoot those kind of things. But if you bring that page up in Fiddler, you can highlight all the things that built the page, and it can build on a timeline. And you can just look at the bars, and you can see that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, large, large images. Because the other thing is, in SharePoint, you can drop a two meg file on the screen and then resize it, and so the picture looks small, but it's still a two meg file. Um, the other one, JS files and CSS files, they can get really big, and people cannot notice. And so you can see those big files, so you can see uh, every little piece of the page and then how long it took to load. So you don't need to understand a lot of things, but you just need to look for the long bars and all that. Um, so that's uh, that's been pretty good. So that's one of the things. Why are pages slow? And then it gives you immediate feedback on whether it works or not. Um, kind of piggybacking on that, you can use Fiddler to find out if caching is working. So if you've got the object cache enabled, that's the cache that you have to enable in the web.config file. You can see if your responses that you're getting are cached files or not. You can look in the headers because one of the things that Fiddler will do well, and I'll talk about it here in a little bit, is um, uh, you can see the headers, all the headers, everything that's in the header. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mark in the chat room has uh, brought up another thing that I wanted to mention is that when people say SharePoint is slow, slow is such a subjective thing. It's tough to measure slow. And more importantly, it's tough to measure when things are not slow anymore. So like Mark mentions here in the chat room, when I have customers, when I was an internal guy, when I would have customers saying SharePoint was slow, I would have them give me a number. I wanted objective things to deal with. And Fiddler was a great way because it was a free tool. So I would have them load it up. I would say, go to this page. And then Fiddler would tell them exactly how long that page took to load. And they would say, it took two seconds to load. And I'd be like, really? Two seconds is too long. That's SharePoint is slow. Or they would say, it took 13 seconds. And that kind of gave me some, some hard numbers to work with. So it's, uh, it's great for that. Uh, Brian Lalancet in the chat room is mentioning that the IE and Chrome and Firefox dev tools, the whole F12 deal, have uh, replaced Fiddler, sort of, but you can't get into the details, or at least I haven't figured out how with the, the development tools. So you can't easily see the headers, you can't see the timelines, uh, you can't see, you know, you can't easily look at a page and see how long each individual thing took. So they, from my experience, they, they complement each other well. They each do things the other one doesn't do. Uh, the next thing that I use Fiddler for, again, because I can see the headers, is this is a great way to find out if Kerberos is working. So Kerberos is kind of a tricky little devil to work with, and there's a bunch of different ways that Kerberos can break. And so once you get everything set up and everything appears to be working, at least as a you know guy that installs SharePoint and all that, it's tough to know if the Kerberos stuff really worked because normally you need Kerberos because of all the BI stuff that hasn't been built yet. So what, you, what I don't want, at least, is I don't want to tell the customer everything's working and then be done, and then a month later when their BI stuff gets built and nothing works, it's because something's not working with Kerberos. So with Fiddler, uh, I can set Kerberos up on a web app, do everything, load that uh, you know, page from that web app in IE through Fiddler, and I can tell from the authentication headers whether it's using Kerberos or not. Really what I can tell is that it's not using NTLM because Kerberos is encrypted. So what you'll get is that you'll see NTLM or 
This appears to be using Kerberos because it can't actually tell because the Kerberos stuff's encrypted. But that's a good gut check to make sure that everything's uh, going down, uh, going down correctly. Another thing that I do, and I've done this one recently, is because you can get to the headers of your requests in SharePoint with Fiddler, you can get your correlation IDs that way. Um, and so normally the way you get a correlation ID on the end user side, if you go to a page and something's breaking, is you turn the developer dashboard on. But the problem with the developer dashboard is you have to turn it on farm wide, and I don't want that thing popping up and confusing uh, users. So I don't like to get my correlation ID that way. So the way that I can get my correlation ID is that um, I can fire a fiddler, go to the page, and it's going to be in one of my headers. It's going to be, it's called X dash correlation or something like that. It's pretty obvious. And then I can take that and I can go back to my SharePoint servers and, uh, and, and do that. Uh, and the final thing is you can get your server health in there. So this kind of uh, piggybacks on why pages are slow. But your web front ends inside of every header for every uh, page request, it gives back a server health number. And that is just, uh, just an idea for how hard that server is working. So if you see things, if things are getting slow or you think things are getting turned off, because that's one of the things that SharePoint does when it gets overworked, you can look at that health score number. And I think it's the, the, the bottom one. Uh, on the, uh, the headers there. So there's just all kinds of gold in those hills when you're trying to figure things out uh, with Fiddler. The other thing with Fiddler, and I think the way that it got its name, is you can fiddle with the requests. So you can kind of get in the middle and tweak things and send them back and forth. But it's a great tool, and I felt uh, pretty excited to see that Eric Lawrence, you know, the guy that wrote that, and, and he used to work at Microsoft. He wrote Fiddler in his spare time, and then uh, Telerik, I think, bought Fiddler. Uh, and so uh, he works for them now. But you can get Fiddler all on your own if you want, if you haven't already, and I should have given the link ahead of time. I gave it to the chat room folks. They've had it. Uh, but you go to Fiddler2.com, and that'll, uh, that'll show it to you. Uh, and one of the things that I've considered and seen in the past is at SharePoint's, uh, <laughs> SharePoint conferences, people, I think Penny Coventry did, uh, a whole session on Fiddler, just a whole 75-minute session on here's how to use Fiddler to troubleshoot SharePoint. And I thought, man, that is genius. I love that. Uh, but Fiddler is one of the many tools that I always have in my SharePoint admin toolbox, you know, that, ULS viewer, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you haven't checked uh, Fiddler out, give it a shot. Free tool, you'll, uh, you'll be glad you did. Okay. Now, for my next topic, this is one that I've talked about a couple of times before, but uh, wanted to add a little bit to it because there's another, another wrinkle to it. So we've all heard about that story, played that game, where one or more of our SharePoint databases was set to use the full recovery model in SQL. And whoever set that server up didn't know or lost track of or whatever, but they were not doing transaction log backups. So I think we all know how this story ends with lots of weeping, gnashing of teeth, all that. But those LDF files will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until they completely fill the drive that they're on. And then they usually take SQL down, if not your whole server, if for whatever reason you're keeping them on your C drive. Bad, bad idea. Uh, so th that story has been played out a hundred times and the fix for that is fairly simple. Get back into SQL set the recovery model on the database to simple or do a transaction log backup, something to tell SQL that it can overwrite those transactions. And then once that's done, uh, then you can go in and on the database, you can shrink the log file back down to whatever it should be normally. So the thing that I always told folks was you can't shrink your log file until all the transactions are backed up and marked overwritable. And that's mostly true, and that's been true for however many years until uh, until a couple of uh, days ago when I had to troubleshoot another issue. So same story, only this time the administrators had set up a transaction log backup, and it had been going fine for months, and then for whatever reason, that, that backup job stopped like a month ago. And they just didn't know. They weren't uh, didn't have monitoring stuff in place, didn't know. And so for a month sneakily behind everybody's back these log files were getting bigger and bigger and bigger until last week they took the server down 
wah, wah, sad, sad trombone. So fix for this, right? I tell them, hey, no problem. This is easy. Uh, back up the transaction logs. Let that set for a minute. Let the database engine go through because we had some pretty big transaction logs here in this whole thing. Uh, and so let that happen, and then you can shrink the transaction logs. Felt like a hero. This was an easy one. And they came back and they said, yeah, we can't. Uh, you know, this 80 gig transaction log is showing 99% in use. And I'm like, man, you guys did something wrong. Uh, this always works. I mean, every time. And I've been, I've been fighting this particular fight for like eight years, maybe more, uh, since the first time I, I, I did this. And so I talked to them a little bit more, and I discovered the asterisk, the wrinkle to all this. They were using always-on availability groups. And here's where it comes in. So in order to shrink the transaction logs, the transactions logs need to be backed up. And here's the new part. And successfully replicated before you can shrink the log files. So they were doing always on stuff. They had their drives mirrored and all that. And the drive on one server filled up with LDF files. The drive on the other server filled up with LDF files. And not only did it make SQL incredibly unhappy, but it broke a bunch of the replication stuff. So when they got SQL working on the primary node, uh, got everything going, got the drives uh, cleared up and all that kind of stuff, the secondary node was still not replicating, was not synchronizing correctly. And so SQL would not let them shrink those transaction logs until it got those log files over to the, the secondary. So, um, so that was an interesting one because I hadn't ever fought it in that exact uh, situation. So for them, what I did the quickest way to get that working is I took the database that had the largest LDF file, and it was a it was a doozy, over 200 gig, it was a big one, um, and just pulled it out of the availability group temporarily. So pulled it out, let the database engine figure out that it didn't need to be replicated anymore, uh, deleted it on the secondary so that it was gone, and then shrunk the transaction log and then added it back in, quick like a bunny, to the availability group. Um, there's a little bit of risk with that in that it can cause um, a little bit of a slowdown because now that so your your application SharePoint is on is uh, uh, talking to the cluster listener and that database is gone so it's kind of got to drop back to the actual uh, database it works it doesn't go away it still works so long as that database exists on the primary but there is some potential for it to be more slowly but more slow but in this case we were just going to do it long enough to get that log file shrunk and then we added it right back in so. The moral of that story was the transaction logs have to be backed up and replicated successfully if replication uh, is enabled. This was another fun one, kind of a weird one, but I thought I would share it with you all. <laughs> um, got, uh, got an app on my phone. Tells me when the mighty cyclones are playing, how it's going. Uh, so... I was working on a thing that I'm going to tell you about in a minute, and I was attaching to the RSS feed for some stuff inside of SharePoint, some lists and some libraries and things like that. And I was getting the results in very weird uh, orders, not the order that they were showing up in the page or anything like that. And it was kind of odd, and it just was there was no rhyme or reason. So I looked into it a little bit and decided that, RSS just wasn't going to be cooperating with me the way that I wanted, but I still needed to sort these results in the right order. So what I ended up doing was creating a view that had the results in the order that I wanted, so sort by date or sort by title or whatever, and then instead of using the RSS feed for the list, I used the RSS feed for the view, and that's kind of hidden. So the RSS feed looks similar, so you know, you've got your and SharePoint RSS feeds are ugly and their URLs are ugly. It's, it's horrible. Um, but the the URL looks similar except at the end it tacks on the view equals and it gives the GUID to the view. Who doesn't love GUIDs in their URLs? But the easier way to do it is if you go into the view, either when you create it or when you edit it or tweak it, in the upper right-hand corner of that page, there's an RSS feed. So I just right-clicked on that, saved that URL, and then that gave me the URL to the RSS feed of the view, which put everything in the right order and let me filter and sort and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and it all worked pretty well. So I thought I would put that one out there. Um, and also that leads me into why I cared about that. So last week 
I told you guys a little bit, gave you a kind of a sneak preview of the Windows Phone app that I've been uh, writing for, for this netcast and from my blog and all that. And that was one of the things. I have an events uh, list, and I needed that to uh, to sort in the right order. And then my blog posts were sorting kind of weird, but I got that uh, got that all figured out. A couple of you in the chat room, a couple of the hooligans helped me test that, and I appreciate that. But I thought I would show you guys um, another uh, another run of this. I have submitted it to the store, so any day now it should be showing up. I checked right before, uh, right before we went online, and it wasn't there, but I was able to download it locally. So... Uh, we've got a couple of things that it does, so you can see it uh, on the bottom of my 920, and a uh, special shout out to Christina Wheeler in the chat room, I, she's the one I got this 920 from. So you can see my app here at the bottom, and uh, like a watched pot, it's not going to boil, but there we go. So it cycles through uh, pictures that I've got in there, which is kind of cool, and it's got the name of the app down there. If you tap the app, I've got some some pages uh, here's so one I've got just kind of an information page who I am that kind of stuff and then for my different pages I got my blog posts and you can go into an individual blog post boop, and read it the the formatting's a little different it uh, there's a few cases where the line feeds get lost I'm not sure what the the issue is with that but uh, so I've got blog posts I've got, oh wait, I've got netcast. So this is pulling off of my YouTube feed. So you can you can watch them right on here. If you tap the the video, it'll show right up and play right in the, right in the app, which is kind of cool. Still the wrong way, uh, and then you can see what's what's in there. I've got um, some some just some websites, links to my blog, links to my builds list. My camera's not uh, there. We go. Camera's not focusing, but just some random links, things like that, uh, just quick links, that kind of stuff, and then finally some some eye candy. Didn't really want the picture uh, section in there, but the pictures end up getting used other places. So, and and the cool thing about this is those pictures are being pulled online, so I can update the pictures and change the pictures without the app having to get updated. So, and then this was the one, another one. Here are the upcoming events that I'm going to be at, and you can go into an event like uh, TechEd or SP TechCon or whatever, and I can see these in the wrong order. I need to tweak that a little bit. But you can see what I'm doing, what dates the event is, where it's at, you know, what the venue is, and then I've got a link to the actual event, so you can uh, click that. Well, if you're not doing it backwards and all that. Um, you can, uh, so, th so that's kind of the thing. So for anybody who cares about what I'm doing or going up, you know, go on at what's going on, uh, you'll be able to uh, to follow it all with here with this. So a few things again. It's got the live tile. You can uh, <laughs> you can uh, it is it's just fun stuff. And I built it all inside of the UI app builder that Microsoft has. If you go to apps.windowsstore.com, I just put it all together uh, in there. And it's pretty cool. Whereas it will let you download. So obviously I can side load the app. I did that and had a couple people. Uh, help me test that. If anybody in the chat room wants this ahead of time, I'll send you the thing out. I don't, I don't care about that. I can email it to you. Um, but so you can download the app, but you can also download the source code. So what's probably going to happen is I've got a bunch of things that I want this app to do that I don't know how to do inside of that web builder thing. And if we've got uh, any Windows Phone developers, Windows Phone 8 developers, that would like to donate some time and help me improve this project, I've got a couple little things I'd like to do. So if you are a Windows Phone developer and do want to help me with that, uh, shoot me an email, todd.clint at rackspace.com, or hit me up on Twitter, at Todd Clint, whatever, and, uh, and volunteer for that. And I'll give you a mad props and, you know, put you on my Christmas card list and all that, uh, <laughs> that crazy stuff. Uh, but I'm pretty excited about this. It's uh, really cool. I, I just got this Windows Phone a month or so ago, and I'm still in the in the honeymoon stage. It's got all kinds of, of fun things, and so this is just one of them. Also, if you follow Laura Rogers, one of my coworkers, she's also got an app out there too under Wonder Laura. You can search for that. Uh, so 
So that's just a fun thing. So if you've uh, got a Windows phone, for goodness sakes, go out and download that app when it's available, and I'll blog it when it's available. Also, I was looking today, the Lumia 520, so the model down from this one, used to be $100 on Amazon, no contract. Then it was $80 on Amazon, no contract. Uh, and now the last time I checked, it was $70 on Amazon. So you can go out to Amazon, buy a Windows phone that will run the absolute latest version of Windows Phone 8 for $70. If you've already got an AT&T account like I do, uh, you can just pop your SIM in there and it'll just work. That's what I did. Or uh, you can get a pay-as-you-go, an AT&T pay-as-you-go SIM and use that. Or for like the first week that I had mine, I just used Wi-Fi and it worked fine. Obviously, I couldn't make phone calls, um, but... It was good. So for 70 bucks, you can get in there, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. So I appreciate that. Um, that was, you know, the, the low barrier to entry is what got me into. So, All right. So last week um, or a week or two ago, I can't remember, I mentioned Ellis, uh, my buddy from Philly. He had some uh, things with that, that workflow timeout issue in the March 2011 patch for SharePoint 2010. Apparently, he liked the fame with me mentioning him on my show. He sent me another thing that he thought I might want to chat about, and I did. I liked it, uh, though I tweaked it a little bit. So he's been doing some cleanup on a SharePoint farm, and he had a, an environment where the auditing had been cranked way up. And at one point, half of the content inside of it, half of the volume of the content database was auditing information. But there's no real easy way to surface that. So... He kind of wanted me to just mention, mention it, uh, just to kind of you know, kind of an awareness thing. There's no ribbon cover for check ribbon color for check your auto log size. You know, no yellow uh, ribbons or pink ribbons or anything like that. And so he uh, wanted me to mention it, but also he came up with a solution where he had a SQL query that he would run to see how many rows the audit uh, table had, and it got the job done. But Ellis did a bad thing. He ran a SQL query against the SharePoint database. You know you try to help people out. You, you tell them the right thing to do. You, you give them some wings to fly, and the first thing they're doing is they're doing SQL queries against their production databases. Uh, Alice, Alice, Alice. So I would never uh, recommend that anybody do that to a live database. It's number one, it's just absolutely not supported by Microsoft even reads, especially reads in environments like this because he's got a table with a lot of rows and if you do a select statement against that, potentially you can lock your database and knock SharePoint offline for a bit. Uh, so what I suggested was that he, and I haven't sent this back to him, so you guys are hearing about it before he does, but the test SP content database commandlet will do the same thing. And so you can use object model code and all the rights and privileges that come from that and get the same information. So instead of doing this dastardly SQL query that Ellis did, um, I like to do it in PowerShell with supported tools. So I did test SP content database, gave it the name of my content database, and this was a database that was mounted in SharePoint, so currently serving out pages and all that. Normally, when you run test SP content database, it's against a database that's not part of your farm but it will work with ones that are part of your farm. So test SP content database dash name, the name of the database, uh, dash web application, the web application that it's in, and here's the tricky part. I gave it a parameter dash show row counts. And what dash show row counts does is it gives you the row counts of all of the tables in that database before it does the test. Okay, so we're almost there. We're home, we're, we're, we're round and third on our way home with this. So uh, then I piped that, because that's going to give you the whole thing. It's going to be a whole screen full of crud. So I piped that to where object, and I looked for the property message, and I said where the property message, where it's value, uh, so I set the, uh, the value to asterisk audit asterisk, and then said like. So I said where... So it's going to go through every one of those messages and say where the message value is like audit, then spit it out. So what it ends up spitting you out is the audit data table is 22 rows long or whatever. Uh, so I like what Ellis was doing, keeping an eye on his audit uh, logs because those can get way out of hand. 
but I didn't like the way he was discovering it. And he also mentioned, he wanted me to mention, that there is a timer job that runs that cleans those up, that if something happens and that timer job fails or if you're attaching a database from a farm that wasn't uh, running that timer job, the first time that runs, if it's a big table, it can lock SharePoint. So knowing this ahead of time, uh, knowing how big that table is, can, can save you some, some grief and some downtime. So thanks to Ellis for that, uh, and I'll, I'll probably blog this, uh, this PowerShell thing because uh, I like blogging PowerShell. PowerShell's cool. Uh, but thanks to Ellis for that. And I can, uh, I can make you famous like I did Ellis. He's probably uh, you know, hanging out with models or something uh, right now, drinking uh, you know, Shivas Revel or Crystal or something, all because of the fame that he got from me mentioning him on my netcast. If you've got uh, something that you would like me to talk about, uh, send me an email. And if it's something that I, you know, interests me or something I'm uh, el or, uh, you know, <laughs> educated about and know enough to talk about, I might, uh, I might talk about it. So thanks again. Now on to the shameless self-promotion part. I, this, this part I really feel needs its own theme music. I keep saying that, but we need to, we need to do something about some little fast guitar lick with a squeal at the end uh, for the shameless self-promotion. As always, the SharePoint uh, Professional 2013 Administration book is out at Fine Books. You know, Christmas is coming up. Uh, Hanukkah's already started. Kwanzaa, Festivus, all of those. Uh, and this, the, the Professional SharePoint 2013 Administration makes an outstanding gift for all of your loved ones. So you can go to toddclint.com slash prosp2013admin, and you can, there's links there for the Kindle version and the uh, Nook, Barnes & Noble version, or you can buy a signed copy from me, so you can get that. Uh, so then we got that events tab on my phone app. Let me tell you a little bit about what's out there. First, I've got a the SharePoint conference is coming up. Been talking a while about having that pre-conference session about installation, configuration, all that kind of stuff. Um, they announced last week what the sessions are, so I will be doing three sessions. And I know the chat room is going to love this, so I'm going to save the save the best one for last. But we're going to be doing a PowerShell session, so using PowerShell with Window or with SharePoint 2013 and SharePoint Online. So we've been doing that one for a few years and just kind of revving that one up. We'll be doing that one. Uh, the next one is the nuts and bolts of upgrading to SharePoint 2013. So if you've got some old databases laying around running a less cool version of SharePoint than 2013, this session will get that uh, knocked out. This session uh, has one of the, the greatest explosions we've ever had at a session. It was a tech ed two years ago. Uh, machine just burst into flames and smoke rolling out of its ears and all that. So you kind of want to go to that session um, and not uh, and not miss the opportunity to see that. And finally, oh man, I don't even I regret even uh, having to say this one out loud. But the third session that we're doing is load testing SharePoint 2013 <clears throat> with Visual Studio 2013. <clears throat> Um, and so now you, I know the folks in the chat room are going to get all excited about uh, me using developer tools. I swear there's no developer -y content in this session, but a not well known and not well publicized fact is that Visual Studio 2013 comes with load balancing and, and stress testing things. And it's something that I've been playing with a little bit in the background. <laughs> and when they put out the call for papers for SharePoint or for SharePoint Conference 2014, I I, I always submit like six, eight, ten sessions. I mean, just a bunch of them. And I always I, I keep a Word document with all my abstracts in it, so from session to session I can pull them out and, and all that. So I always submit a lot because I want to give the people setting these conferences up a lot of options. So I threw that one in sort of on a lark, and I didn't expect they would take it. And they did. So I'm going to be, uh, and Shane's already told me he wants nothing to do with this session, so I will be writing this session. But basically what I'm going to do in this session, and it's something that I've done a couple times for customers, is walking through what the load testing uh, options are inside of Visual Studio so that you can point it at your SharePoint installation <laughs> and see see where the, the bottlenecks are, where, where the breaking points are. And it's something that we have done at Rackspace with some of our customer solutions, some of our own solutions. <laughs> and uh, it's always interesting to see where it breaks first. And so this, this, in, in this session, we'll show you how to do that. And there's all kinds of great options for it. And it's, uh, it's great for us admins, too. So as, as I thought, the, uh, the chat room is going wild. Um, but that's a good session. Uh, I've 
I'm looking forward to doing it because there's just amazing fun stuff in there. And and load testing SharePoint's kind of tough. Comes up all the time, so I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to get that out there so people can see how to do it. So that's the SharePoint conference, uh, and then we're doing our pre-con, which is the installation thing. The pre-con is March 2nd. The conference itself is March 3rd through the 6th. That's at Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, and that will be at the Venetian. So you can go to SharePointConference.com and uh, sign up for that now. Don't miss it. You'll regret it if you do. So that's in March. The next month in April, I'm going to be at SP TechCon. We're doing some sessions there, and I don't uh, don't remember what we're doing. Excuse me, so I can't... Uh, can't tell you because I don't remember. Again, submitted six, eight, ten, something like that, and then uh, then forgot what they accepted. But that is SP TechCon. That's in San Francisco. That's the spring one. It's April twenty second through the twenty fifth. And uh, oh, and geez, I forgot about it. at the SharePoint conference. They're going to have the whole SharePoint uh, SPC TV. I've talked to them. I'm going to be doing the netcast there sometime live. So they've always got a big studio set up. But uh, we've gotten the green light on that. I don't know when that's going to happen, you know, what day or anything. That probably won't get figured out for a couple, three weeks here. But if you're going to be at the SharePoint conference, keep an eye out. There will be a live taping of this whole mess. And my uh, ball and chain, Shane, will be there, probably take some other folks, folks in the chat room or whatever, and, uh, and, and get that going. So definitely want to do that. But the reason I bring that up is at SP TechCon, we're going to be doing the same thing. We've done that uh, for a few. <laughs> so Lori in the chat room uh, looked, apparently SP TechCon has it online. So we'll be doing a PowerShell session there, uh, administrator session, and upgrade. Um, so, But uh, again, live netcast. Last time there was GIFs and all kinds of stuff. It was great. And then finally in May, it's uh, Microsoft's TechEd North America event. And that is May 12th through the 15th in sunny Houston. Houston's being represented right now in the chat room. So shout out to Teresa. And Shane and I will be doing a probably a pre-con, probably very similar to the one that we're doing at the SharePoint conference, installation, configuration, that kind of deal. So if you're going to go to TechEd, uh, definitely look into that one. We'll be around and, and all that. Don't know about doing a netcast from there yet. Got to talk to those folks and find out. So... Uh, that is it for the self-promotion. As those things start trickling in, I will let you guys know. And if you have the official Todd Clint app on your Windows phone, uh, when I know these things, I will update that list, and you will find out soon, maybe sooner than your friends. So you got that going for you. But uh, So thanks, everybody. Chat room, uh, good to see everybody. I'll stick around in the chat room for a few minutes after the show. We can uh, chat about some stuff. But as always, you can watch this, uh, the recordings at youtube.com slash Netcast. You can go out to toddclint.com slash netcast to join into the chat room. We do this every Monday night, 8.30 Central Time in the U.S. You can find me on Twitter, at Todd Clint, uh, all that kind of stuff. So anybody that's uh, ever, you know, met me or whatever i'm a pretty friendly guy so don't be a stranger jump into the chat room we got some new folks and new faces in there tonight good to see them i'm a pretty friendly guy so jump in and say hey uh, but this is me signing off again got that baby coming at some point don't know when it's going to be so there may not be a netcast next week i just don't i don't know what that schedule is going to look like but the best way to keep up with that is to follow me on twitter at todd clint and that's how you'll know so thanks everybody uh you guys have a good night and i will see you next week <laughs>